Now we turn to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackson Carlow. Presiding officer, may I begin today by noting that the Prince of Wales is today joining world leaders gathering in Israel to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the liberation of the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp, survivors of which continue to live happily among us today in Scotland. We, of course, will be marking the occasion with a debate next week, but Scotland will remember and always stand in memory of those who perished in order that we can prevent any such horror ever happening again. Uh, presiding officer, water pouring in through ceilings and windows, mushrooms growing in the carpets, and rats scurrying about the mouldy floors. What word, would the First Minister, what word would the First Minister use to describe the state of some of Scotland's police stations? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I take the opportunity to associate myself with uh, the remarks of Jackson Carlow about the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau? Uh, uh, that anniversary, I think, is very much in the thoughts of all of us at this time. Uh, the horror of what was experienced there is beyond our imaginations, and we must all be determined as we prepare to mark the anniversary in our own ways here in Scotland next week. We must all be determined to play our parts in ensuring that a horror of that nature and on that scale can never be allowed to happen again. Um, on the issue of uh, policing, presiding officer, um, I would say that I do think uh, Jackson Carlow has something of a nerve uh, to raise issues like this. Because before I, before I address the issue directly, let me just remind Jackson Carlow and the Chamber that it was indeed the Conservative Party that reduced uh, the resource budget of this government by £1.5 billion, pounds, that's 5% in real terms since 2010. It's also the Conservatives who have uh, robbed the Scottish Police Service of £125 million pounds in VAT that should never have been claimed. But despite... Despite all of that, since 2016, the annual budget for policing in Scotland has increased by more than £80 million, bringing it to £1.2 billion in this year. The capital budget of the service has increased in this year alone by 52% uh, to support the rollout of mobile technology. Uh, so we are investing in police officers, also, of course, maintaining a 1,000 more police officers yeah. in our communities, uh, while the Tories have cut 20,000 from the streets uh, in England. So we'll take no lectures from the Conservatives on matters of public services. And as we prepare our budget for the year ahead, presiding officer, our priority will continue to be investment in public services and we'll leave Jackson Carlaw to argue for tax cuts for the highest paid in our country. Jackson Carlaw. Well, the cliché meter was ringing loud there, was it not? <laughs> but I noticed in that long uh, peroration, the one word the First Minister didn't use was hyperbole. But that's exactly how her Justice Secretary reacted when he was confronted with these pretty shocking images of working conditions in some of Scotland's police stations. It's no wonder that the head of the Scottish Police Federation is furious at Mr Yusuf's denial. Warnings from frontline police officers about the conditions in which they are being forced to work have been made year after year, but little or nothing is done. Who is right, the Scottish Police Federation or Mr Yusuf? First Minister. Interesting that what Jackson Carlaw refers to as cliche is actually investment by this government in our vital public services. So let me just repeat again the commitment of this government to our hard-working police officers who, yes, work under pressure like all of our public sector workers do. That pressure having been exacerbated over the past 10 years by austerity imposed on this government by Conservatives at Westminster. This government, in contrast uh, to what we see south of the border, is protecting Police Scotland's revenue budget during this Parliament. Uh, that includes in this year alone a £42.3 million increase in funding. Police Scotland's total capital expenditure is the fourth highest of all UK police forces. Uh, there has been a £12 million increase in this financial year alone. Uh, we're also providing reform funding to the SPA and of course we are maintaining uh, police numbers significantly above the level inherited 
in 2007. Uh, and uh, into the bargain, uh, we gave our police officers a higher pay rise than they got in any other part of the UK. So I know the pressure police officers work under. I'm grateful for the job they do each and every day. We will continue in our budget decisions to prioritise our public service workers. And I think the Tories uh, should actually be ashamed at their own record in Westminster in this regard. Jackson Carlo. These long perorations from civil service prepared briefs really don't cut it, First Minister. This isn't just about unpleasant, uncomfortable and potentially unsanitary situations in which police officers and staff are expected to work. There are major safety concerns too. Even as Mr Yusuf was dismissing concerns as hyperbole, the ceiling was falling down at the police station in Broughty Ferry, not just literally but also metaphorically on Mr Yusuf's denial. Under the SNP, out of 45 UK police forces, Police Scotland is the fifth worst funded. However, yesterday, yesterday, the UK government announced over a billion pounds extra for policing, with the Scottish government receiving some 100 million. Will the First Minister assure our hardworking police officers that this additional funding will be used to protect police officer numbers and at the very least improve the environment in which they are expected to work? First Minister. While, while the Conservatives have been cutting the budget of this government, we've been protecting the budget of Absolutely. Scotland's police service. And of course, uh, because of the incompetence of the UK government, we are required to set our budget for uh, the next financial year before we've seen the colour of the money that Jackson Carlaw keeps saying is coming our way. So I certainly hope uh, those promises uh, turn out to be accurate. We will continue to do everything we can uh, within our powers and our resources to protect our police service the length and breadth of the country. As I said a moment ago, total uh, capital expenditure in Police Scotland is the fourth highest of all UK police forces. Uh, we've increased capital budgets in this year by 50 2 per cent. We're protecting the revenue budget, we're protecting police numbers and we're making sure that our police officers uh, get the rise in pay that they deserve, that police officers elsewhere in the UK are not getting. So we'll continue uh, to support our police officers as they continue to support the people of Scotland in the excellent work that they do each and every day. Jackson Carlo. First Minister, the budget this SNP government receives from Westminster is on the rise. And what do we have to show for it? Leaking police stations and collapsing ceilings, half-built ferries, boarded up hospitals and closed off children's wards, a crisis in Scotland schools. Years of missed opportunity from a distracted and disengaged government. Because next week we are promised yet more updates on her favourite topic. First Minister, what chance is there of updating us instead on when your government is going to start sorting out the things that really matter, which are failing under this SNP administration? First Minister. Well, let me just update uh, Jackson Carlow again on the reality uh, in Scotland, as opposed uh, to what he wants people to think. £1.5 billion in real terms removed from this government's budget by the Conservatives over the past 10 years. Uh, but in spite of that, we've continued to invest in our NHS, taking it to record levels of funding. We've continued to invest in our police service. We've continued to support our public service workers working so hard across the country. Uh, but let me uh, just draw to Jackson Carlaw's attention what the Fraser of Allender Institute has to say about his proposals that he's put forward just in the last couple of weeks. The Freder of Allender Institute makes clear, I'm a, oh, I'm about to read it out. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm quoting here directly, uh, Jackson Carlaw's proposals would, and I quote, reduce the government's income tax revenues by around 270 million pounds. He wants me to, he wants me to go on. So I will go on. Uh, in addition to that, they say that this isn't about middle earners. They say, and again, I'm quoting, a policy framed as supporting middle earners predominantly benefits households at the top of the distribution of household income. So there we have it, presiding officer. £270 million out of our public services and handy to the richest in our society. That's what Jackson Carlaw would deliver. I'll continue to deliver investment in our public services. Question number two, Richard Leonard. 
Uh, presiding officer, can I uh, associate the Scottish Labour Party with the remarks about the importance of commemorating the liberation of Auschwitz uh, and uh, ensuring that we all accept that it is all of our duty never to forget the Holocaust, not just for this generation, but for future generations to come. Presiding officer, the SNP came into office promising students that they would dump the debt monster. But they didn't dump the debt, they dumped the promise. This week, Audit Scotland revealed the consequences of that dump promise. Student debt now soaring to £5.5 billion, more than double the level it was in 2011. And this is not simply down to an expansion of student numbers, because what the report also showed is that average student debt per head has more than doubled as well. And we know that it is the poorest students from the poorest communities who are forced to borrow the most. First Minister, will you simply admit that the SNP misled students and will you apologise to them? First Minister. Well, what I will do is point out that because of the policies of this SNP government, not least keeping access to university free of tuition fees, Scotland has the lowest level of student debt anywhere in the UK. So let's look in particular uh, at the figures. Uh, the stats that Richard Leonard cites, yes, show that average student loan debt in Scotland is £13,800. But that compares to a figure in England of £35,950. A figure in Northern Ireland of £23,550. And that figure in SNP-governed Scotland of £13,800 compares to a figure in Labour-run Wales of £22,920. So I think the ones who should be apologising are perhaps the Labour Party for the record in Wales. Richard Leonard. Well, some students in Scotland have debts of £27,000. And First Minister, you know, you know in your heart of hearts that you are failing to support our students properly. That's why three years ago you set up an independent review of student support. Two years ago it reported. The Minister accepted its recommendations. Parliament supported its core recommendation of a guaranteed minimum student income based on the living wage. But two years on and nothing has happened. You are letting students down. How many generations of Scottish students have to go through university before this government keeps any promise on support for student living? First Minister. OK, I, I hope Richard Leonard is going to listen carefully to the detail of this answer. But before I get on to the detail, I've already uh, told him that Scotland is the lowest level of student debt in the UK. Uh, but in addition to that, we've also seen the smallest increase uh, in student debt of any of the countries of the UK. £7,800 in Scotland, £9,840 of an increase where Labour are in government in Wales. Uh, Richard Leonard says that total debt uh, has increased uh, in Scotland. It has. But in the rest of the UK, it has trebled. Uh, so those are the facts. But let's come on to uh, support for poorer students. Full-time students from the poorest areas uh, receive more support than from the richest areas. 67% uh, of students from the 20% most deprived areas got a bursary compared to 22% in the richest areas. But the part I want to come on to in detail is what Richard Leonard said about action after the student support review. He said, and I think I'm quoting him directly here, nothing has happened. So this is the detail I would like him to pay close attention to, because since that uh, review was published, we have firstly uh, begun to implement its income guarantee by increasing the bursary for care experienced students to £8,100 a year. Uh, following the recommendations, we've raised the higher education bursary threshold. Uh, we've increased bursary support for the poorest uh, young students. We've increased bursary support for the poorest independent students in higher education. In further education, we increased the bursary up to £4,500 
a year and we are going to introduce a guaranteed system of uh, further education bursaries uh, and we are going to move further with the other recommendations. So Richard Leonard might describe that as nothing, but for students across the country, it means more money in their pockets and I think they will welcome it warmly indeed. Richard Leonard. Well, First Minister, these are the facts. In, two, in 2013, you decimated bursary support. In 2013, bursary support in Scotland was worth £2,640 a year. You've only just put it back to £2,000 a year. That's £600 less than the level it was at before. So to recap, you promised to dump the debt, but student debt has soared. And it's those students from the most deprived backgrounds who are leaving university with the heaviest burden of debt. This government is letting down our students, but it's also letting down our universities. Universities Scotland describe, and I quote them, a pattern of cuts to core budgets. Cuts that add up to a 12% real terms decrease since 2014-15. This is a cut of £700 for every Scottish student since you became First Minister. And the fact is this, government funding for our universities is decreasing at a faster rate than the Scottish Government's own budget, leading Universities Scotland to conclude, and I quote them again, university funding has been deprioritised. First Minister, when the budget comes to Parliament next month, will you reprioritise Scotland's universities? Will you reprioritise Scotland students? Or will, you dump, Order. or will you dump more cuts on our universities and dump more debt on our students? First Minister. Can I remind Richard Leonard that his party brought an opposition debate to this chamber yesterday demanding that we prioritise additional money for local government in the budget. Today, less than 24 hours later, He's here in the chamber demanding that it's higher education. Can I suggest next week he comes along and tells us where he thinks all this money should be coming from? Labour have no credibility on budgets and that performance just demonstrates exactly why. But let's go back to higher education. What, we've, what Richard Leonard has managed to establish today is that we have the lowest student debt anywhere in the UK. Uh, we have rising support for students in Scotland, including students from our most deprived areas. Let me give them some other facts. Total full-time student support is up by 1.3%. Uh, Average higher education student support has increased. More full-time higher education students than ever are receiving support now. And of course, we saw the access stats out last week that show we've got record numbers uh, of Scottish domiciled, full-time, first degree entrance to university at, at record levels. And uh, the entrance from our most deprived areas are at record levels as well. Those are the facts, Mr Leonard. That's the reality. It's under an SNP government and it's why people don't ever want Labour back in government again. Thank you. We've got some constituency supplementary questions. The first from Bob Doris, to be followed by Alec Rowley. Bob uh, Doris. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Bob uh, Doris. I am pr privileged to have a wonderful baby food bank in Springburn. In and Mr. Doris, I'll just have just a, a short suspension. Parliament suspended shortly. So thank you. After that short pause, Bob Doris, can you resume with a supplementary question? Th thanks, President Officer. Well, I'm standing up to support a wonderful baby food bank in Springburn in my constituency, although I'm saddened that it's required. NHS health visitors used to refer families in need to it, but this appears to have largely stopped due to the NHS's interpretation of UNICEF guidance on breastfeeding and the use of formula milk. A local Trussell Trust food bank is now also reviewing its guidance. Can I ask the First Minister that whilst I do still await a reply from NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde 
Can the Scottish Government provide clarity to at least make sure vulnerable families know where to go to get that absolutely valuable and vital support? Yeah, yeah. First Minister. Well, can I thank Bob Dorris for his question and, of course, uh, for representing uh, the food bank that he has raised today. I mean, nobody should ever have to rely on charitable food provision in a country as rich as Scotland, especially families with young children. And that's why we're committed to eradicating child poverty and have enhanced support across the early years with the Best Start grant and the Best Start food payment card. We're also, of course, introducing the new Scottish child payment for eligible children under six by Christmas this year. Uh, in relation to this specific point, I will ask the Health Secretary engage, to engage with the Health Board uh, so that we can uh, help uh, with interpretation of UNICEF guidance, uh, if that is possible, and also encourage a pragmatic approach regarding the provision of sustenance for infants, which is so important. Alec Rowley, to be followed by Alison Johnson. Alec Rowley. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government published a low-carbon economic strategy for Scotland back in 2010, and on the subject to offshore wind, the strategy stated, and I quote, this sector alone offers the potential for 20,000 direct jobs and a further 20,000 jobs in related industries investment in Scotland by 2020. The jobs and opportunities are not coming to Scotland. Whilst the yards in Fife and elsewhere lie empty, the jobs are going to United Arab Emirates, Belgium, Spain, Indonesia, China, anywhere but Scotland. What is the government doing to fight for Scotland, to bring jobs to Scotland, to make sure that it is the people of Scotland who get the benefits from Scotland's natural resources? First Minister. Okay, thank, thank Alec Rowley uh, for raising this because I, I share his frustration and the government is working extremely hard to make sure that more of the economic benefit of these projects uh, is experienced here in Scotland. It's not true to say there are no jobs coming to Scotland. If we look at the NNG project, where we hope there will be jacket fabrication work going to Bifab, but we've also seen, uh, for example, INH Brown in Perth being awarded uh, work for the onshore substation uh, work. We've seen the Port of Dundee confirmed as the installation port, Eyemouth Harbour confirmed as the maintenance base. Uh, similarly with Seagreen and I, uh, met with senior management uh, at SSE about Seagreen uh, last week, but we see, uh, for example, work uh, going to Montrose. The announcement they made last week about Petrofac uh, is beneficial to Aberdeen, but we want to see more fabrication and manufacturing work uh, coming to Scotland, which is why we established uh, the summit that met last week. It's also why we've announced uh, the future arrangements around the Crown Estate uh, leasing round that will uh, happen soon. Uh, developers are going to be required to set out the anticipated level and location of supply chain impact. Uh, these will be commitments that are part of the agreement process, so there will be contractual consequences if these commitments are not delivered. Uh, so that's what this government is doing within the powers we have. But I know Alec Rowley is absolutely sincere about this, so I hope he will agree with me that we must put or keep putting pressure on the UK government to do more through the contract for difference process because that's where the real levers lie. Uh, I know the trade unions uh, agree with that. Uh, I certainly think that's important and I hope we get support from Alec Rowley uh, and Labour as we continue to pressure the UK government to do more within their powers as well. Alison Johnson. Thank you. Over the last week, almost 2,000 objections have been sent to Transport Scotland. Objections to the proposals for a £120 million flyover at Sheriff Hall that the Scottish Government agrees will lead to even worse traffic. In the face of the climate emergency, does the First Minister agree that it's time to ditch this dated and dirty project from a bygone era and invest this sum instead in public transport, park and rides, cycling and walking, in the solutions, not the problem? First Minister. Well, obviously, objections will be considered. There is a process uh, to be gone through, and it's important that things are uh, properly considered. I've also said uh, many times in this chamber that we have to be prepared to look at all sorts of things to make sure we're meeting our climate obligations. But in terms of the Sheriff Hall uh, roundabout, of course, if we do nothing, congestion increases. Uh, in fact, will possibly increase uh, faster and make the situation worse. So we've got to make sure that we are thinking carefully about these things, but that we're taking balanced action that reduces our emissions um, and of course, encourages active travel as well. And uh, the budget that we will bring forward, as well as the updated climate change action plan, will look to do all of these things and look to do them in the proper and sensible way. Question number three, Willie Rennie. Uh, we must remember so we can learn so those awful events are never repeated. 
Holocaust Memorial Day is indeed so important. Uh, the First Minister knows I have deep concerns about the mental health of many of our police officers. New research has found that 35% of police officers were turning up to work mentally unwell. In the last few weeks, four police officers have died from suicide. We don't know the reasons behind those tragedies, but police officers across the country want to know whether work contributed to their deaths. So will the First Minister order an investigation into the mental health of police officers and the support that is available to them? First Minister. Well, Willie Rennie is right to raise an important issue. Can I uh, convey my condolences to the families of police officers uh, who have died in uh, recent weeks? I think, and I hope Willie Rennie uh, will appreciate and agree with this, we don't know yet uh, all of the causes uh, and, and uh, the factors behind those deaths. It's important they are, they are all properly investigated, and I don't think it is either helpful or appropriate or sensitive for us to speculate too much uh, on individual cases uh, now. But the mental health of our police officers, of, of everybody working in our public services is hugely important. I have uh, spoken, uh, I think, in response to Willie Rennie in the past in the chamber about some of the work that the police service is doing to support the well-being and mental health of police officers. Uh, police officers and staff can already access a range of services uh, to care for uh, both their physical and their mental health, uh, including through Police Scotland's Your Wellbeing Matters programme. The Scottish Government is providing uh, funding to extend the Lifeline Scotland Wellbeing programme to blue light responders, including Police Scotland. Uh, Police Scotland launched uh, a wellbeing programme in 2017, which includes the introduction of wellbeing champions. Uh, that's raised awareness of the services available, such as occupational health and employee assistance, which offers counselling, and a force-wide wellbeing and engagement survey will be launched uh, soon. Uh, that will help, I hope, to identify factors that impact on the wellbeing of officers um, to then enable Police Scotland to prioritise further activities and investment. So, yes, I do agree uh, that we have to consider further action in this regard, but I think it's also important that we make police officers uh, as aware as possible of the support that is already there for them uh, within Police Scotland right now. Will you ready? That is a helpful response from the First Minister. We do need to understand more about the mental well-being of our police. I would urge an investigation to look at the contracted out welfare services for police officers. Before centralisation, each police force had dedicated welfare officers who were directly responsible for looking after the well-being of a number of police. But now the service has been contracted out and Callum Steele from the Scottish Police Federation says it is a poor substitute. So will that service be part of an investigation? Sir. Well, in the spirit of trying to respond uh, helpfully on this issue, because it is such an important issue, I will take that issue away and uh, discuss with the Justice Secretary and uh, the Chief Constable about that uh, in particular, and happy to come back to Willie Rennie on that. Um, obviously, there are, and, and rightly, are investigations into individual circumstances. I've already talked about some of the work that uh, the police service is doing. Um, so these matters should be and will continue to be investigated. And I, I rule nothing out, and nothing should be ruled out in terms of how we improve the uh, mental health and wellbeing support for police officers. Uh, we want there to be proper support available given the stressful nature of the job that police officers do. And it's right that uh, not only that I am able to stand here and say it's a quality service, but the police officers who rely on these services themselves feel that they are quality services. So I'm happy to give further consideration to Willie Rennie's questions uh, today, and I'm sure we'll come back to this issue further in uh, the future. Some further supplementaries. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by James Kelly. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, last month in Wuhan, China, coronavirus, a respiratory disease, emerged which has so far killed at least six people and infected hundreds, spreading to other Asian countries and Australia. Concerns have already been expressed by virologists that due to its incubation time and no symptoms are present, many others were already being infected. And Wuhan has international air links with some 60 cities, including London. At this time of year, of course, many more Chinese people travel due to it being Chinese New Year. Can the First Minister advise the Chamber as to what precautions have been taken and are being taken to deal with coronavirus should it reach our shores? First Minister. Well, I can assure Kenny Gibson and indeed uh, assure the Chamber that uh, together with Health Protection Scotland, we are very closely monitoring uh, what is a rapidly evolving situation. I should say 
that the risk to the public here in Scotland and indeed the UK is currently classified as low, but obviously that is kept under review. Health Protection Scotland are liaising with NHS boards and are currently in daily contact with Public Health England. We're also liaising daily with colleagues in the UK Department of Health. We're also paying very close attention to the decisions and the advice that comes from the World Health Organisation. Um, I can also uh, say that enhanced monitoring measures have been implemented for flights from Wuhan City to Heathrow. Uh, that will involve each flight being met by a port health team who will check for symptoms of coronavirus and provide information to all passengers. And we're currently considering whether there's any further information that could helpfully be provided at Scottish airports. So uh, this is obviously a, an evolving situation which we will monitor extremely closely um, and the Health Secretary or I will ensure that Parliament is appropriately updated uh, in the days and weeks to come. James Kelly to be followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I draw the First Minister's attention to the concerns of FDA union members in the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service? Over a seven-year period, entry-level solicitors at other Scottish government departments have been paid and a total £94,000 more than those working in the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service. Uh, this is deeply concerning given the importance and the sensitivity of the cases that have been dealt with here. Does the First Minister agree that this pay gap is unacceptable? And will she commit to take urgent action to ensure that those who are carrying out uh, similar roles and responsibilities are paid equally? First Minister. Well, I am uh, aware of the situation. Can I uh, say at the outset that we value highly the work of uh, lawyers in the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service? Um, obviously, we are in a budget process right now. Uh, pay uh, discussions are uh, primarily between employees and uh, employer, in this case, uh, the Crown Office. Uh, but these are all matters that we uh, will seek to address uh, within the budget decisions uh, that we uh, take uh, to make sure uh, not only uh, that we're valuing uh, people doing these jobs, but that we uh, move to a situation as quickly as is reasonably possible, not just in this uh, area, but uh, more generally, where we have uh, pay cohesion uh, across our public services. Mark Ruskell to be followed by Stuart McMillan. The First Minister yesterday called for a well-being economy. Her Infrastructure Commission this week laid out a path to deliver it, a switch away from road building to road repair, an investment in congestion busting public transport, a rebalancing of priorities and actions. Given the urgent need to tackle the climate emergency, improve our health and keep the economy moving, will the First Minister act on this advice in the forthcoming budget? First Minister. The advice of the Infrastructure Commission will be an important part of our budget uh, consideration. Uh, we obviously established the Infrastructure Commission. I think its phase one uh, report, which was uh, published in the last few days, is a very helpful contribution uh, to how we make sure the country has uh, fit for purpose infrastructure over the next decade and beyond, but how we do that in a way that is consistent with our climate change obligations. So both in terms of our budget, in the work that we're doing right now to update the climate change action plan, uh, this uh, work and these recommendations are extremely helpful to us as we decide the best ways forward. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President. Officer, uh, yesterday at the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, uh, Edward Mountain asked whether it would be better building CalMac vessels in South Korea as compared to Scotland. Well, the First Minister take this opportunity to reiterate this government's commitment to shipbuilding in Port Glasgow. First Minister. Um, yes, uh, we want to ensure that shipbuilding uh, can continue in Port Glasgow. That's why we've taken the action uh, we took to secure uh, both the jobs in Ferguson's right now and the future of that yard. Uh, clearly, there is a parliamentary inquiry underway into the contracts uh, for these ferries, but we want to see these ferries built as quickly as possible and longer term. We want to see shipbuilding at Ferguson's well into the future. I'm not sure what the position of the Scottish Conservatives is, but that is very clearly the position of this Scottish Government. Question number four, Sandra White. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the First Minister what action has been taken to address the reported problems with toxicology services at the University of Glasgow. First Minister. Forensic toxicology services are provided by Glasgow University under a contract between the University and the Crown Office. Last month, the Crown Office announced an extension until September this year of that contract. Uh, these services are essential for the independent functions of the Lord Advocate to effectively prosecute crime and investigate deaths. 
That announcement of the extension was accompanied by a £300,000 investment for the university to recruit additional staff, buy new equipment, address the backlog of cases awaiting analysis and secure better provision of the service until September. Uh, I very much appreciate the impact that delays in this service have upon families affected. Uh, the Lord Advocate is keeping me closely updated on the steps that the Crown Office is taking to urgently address these issues. Sandra White. I thank the First Minister for that response and, like me, as she already said, will appreciate the pain and frustration for those who are grieving and waiting on these reports to be completed. And I do appreciate these services are contracted independently by the Crown Office, but can the First Minister confirm that the Lord Advocate Office is taking steps not only for future provision of these services, but to resolve the outstanding cases as quickly as possible? First Minister. Uh, well, I thank Sandra White for raising what is an important issue. I understand that the Crown Office has identified another provider and is working with that provider on a transfer of staff and service provision. Uh, that's part of an overall programme of work for the longer term pathology, mortuary and toxicology services. Uh, in the meantime, uh, for some casework, Crown Office officials are looking at increasing capacity for those services. And in discussion with health colleagues, the Crown Office is looking at the assistance of the NHS in the short to medium term. Negative analysis amount to 40% uh, of the outstanding cases and Crown officials are working with the university to identify what analysis is required in each remaining case and that will allow them to ascertain how best to manage that. Uh, we will of course provide whatever support we can to these efforts to ensure that these outstanding cases are resolved as quickly as is possible. Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This week I was contacted by constituents who lost a family member in distressing circumstances in October and have still not been told of the cause of death some three months later due to delays with the toxicology service. I'm sure the First Minister would agree this is a highly distressing situation uh, for already grieving parents. And can she give the family some assurance as to when they might get the information they're waiting for? First Minister. Uh, well, yes, I, I do understand uh, how distressing this is for families. Uh, if Murdo Fraser uh, wants to provide the details of his constituent, I will ask the Crown Office to contact him directly uh, to provide what further information can be provided in that uh, individual case. Um, more generally, I've already uh, talked about the additional investment uh, to recruit staff uh, to help uh, reduce the backlog and some of the other steps that the Crown Office is taking, as well as indicating the direction of travel for the longer term of this uh, service. I'm discussing uh, the matter regularly with the Lord Advocate. He is keeping me updated and uh, I, I want the Chamber to understand uh, how seriously um, I think uh, of this situation and how important and urgent it is that the backlog is dealt with and that the service uh, in the future uh, doesn't incur backlogs like this again. And Monica Lynn. First Minister, almost 2,000 families, possibly more, have been failed. Some waiting as long as nine months to find out why their loved one died. We've had assurances from the Lord Advocate that he would fix this. And months ago, the Justice Secretary told me to accept those assurances that it was all under control, but it's escalated into a national disgrace. Families are suffering and vital public health information, including on drug-related deaths, is being disrupted. Families want to know why this has been a low priority and why ministers and the Lord Advocate have given false assurances. But most of all, they want to know why their loved ones have died. First Minister, isn't it time that you gave this your full attention? Because that's what it deserves. First Minister. This has uh, my full attention. This is a Crown Office uh, matter. I, uh, as I've said, have discussed this matter. Uh, I'm discussing this matter regularly with the Lord Advocate. I've set out the actions that are being taken. These are not false assurances. These are the concrete steps, including additional investment, that are being taken uh, to resolve what is a serious uh, matter. Uh, on the issue of the drug death stats, um, obviously it is important uh, that this backlog is dealt with uh, in order uh, that these uh, statistics are, are published. No decision, and I want to be very clear here, that no decision on a delay to this summer's publication uh, has been taken, and there's certainly been no indication put to ministers that publication would be delayed uh, to next year, which I saw speculated on in the media uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, this is a serious issue. It is commanding serious attention um, and serious steps been taken to make sure that it is resolved as quickly as possible. Question five, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the rise in pollution levels on main thoroughfares in Scotland's cities. First Minister. 
Compared to the rest of the UK and other parts of Europe, Scotland enjoys a high level of air quality and has more stringent air quality targets than other parts of the UK, but there are still areas where air quality is below acceptable levels. The remaining pollution hotspots are in part attributable to road transport emissions in urban areas. We're therefore working to deliver low emission zones across our four biggest cities by the end of this year, with the first already introduced in Glasgow. We're also supporting local authorities in tackling local air pollution hotspots through four and a half million pounds of annual funding. An independent review of the Cleaner Air uh, Scotland strategy has identified priorities for additional action and a new strategy taking into account its findings will be published later this year. Rachel Hammond. I thank the First Minister for that answer. But First Minister, it is simply unacceptable that air poll pollution levels continue to rise across Scotland, consistently breaking the legal limits and causing respiratory problems and even premature deaths. Presiding officer, I asked the First Minister on the 22nd of May last year if the Scottish Government were taking the damaging impact of air pollution seriously. Clearly, very little has been done as we see no progress. And the situation is worsening. The Scottish Conservatives have long called for air quality monitors to be given to schools to reassure parents that children are breathing clean air on the way to school. So for the second time, can I ask the First Minister, will she finally take affirmative action and commit to air quality monitors for all schools across Scotland for the sake of children's health? Yeah. Minister. Uh, well, we'll consider uh, all uh, positive suggestions, including uh, that one. Can I say, though, um, to uh, Rachel Hamilton, because um, I think it's important that this is, is put in context, it's a serious issue, but the number of sites exceeding the objectives is actually reducing for nitrogen dioxide uh, from 14 in 2013 to 6 in 2019 and for particulate matter from 17 in 2013 to just 1 in 2019. So that is a reduction in the number of sites, but nevertheless, uh, while there are any, that is too many. Uh, what this government is doing is firstly uh, committing to low emission zones uh, in our four largest cities, that's important. Uh, I've already talked about the review of the cleaner air strategy, and we're currently considering uh, the recommendations uh, to inform a new air quality strategy. Uh, we have already also set more stringent air quality targets than the rest of the UK and we're the first country anywhere in Europe to legislate for particulate matter 2.5, uh, which is a pollutant of special concern for human health. So this government is taking serious action. Of course, we're also proposing other things, uh, giving local authorities the power to introduce workplace uh, parking levy, to keep cars uh, out of our uh, cities and, and towns where that is possible. And perhaps if I could say this gently to the Conservatives, if they stopped their knee-jerk opposition to things like that, then perhaps they would be taken a bit more seriously on these very important issues. Question six, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to figures from Oxfam Scotland, which estimate that the value of unpaid care work across the country is £36 billion. First Minister. Uh, well, our uh, carers make an immense contribution uh, to our society, and that's why the Government is determined to do everything we can to support Scotland's carers. It is important to note that Oxfam's £36 billion figure covers unpaid care and also a wider range of unpaid tasks such as childcare, uh, cooking and housework. Uh, but in terms of our support for carers, the Carers Act gives every carer the right to a personalised plan and support to meet eligible needs. Uh, we're fully funding the Act. We provided £17.4 to local authorities last year and an additional £10.5 million this year. Uh, this year, our package of investment in social care and integration exceeds £700 million, a 29% increase over the previous year. And of course, under our new social security powers, our carers allowance supplement gives eligible carers an extra £452.40 this year compared to carers elsewhere in the rest of the UK. But I would uh, want to take this opportunity to thank uh, unpaid carers uh, for the work they do each and every day. Mark Griffin. I thank the First Minister for that answer. The, the, the work backed by One Parent Family Scotland, Carer Scotland and the Health and Social Care Alliance highlights those living in or at risk of poverty tend to spend more hours caring, while Oxfam's polling also finds 7 in 10 Scots support increased social security benefits for carers. The First Minister will know that when the Department for Work and Pensions increases the carers' allowance earnings threshold, by just £5 in April. It won't keep pace with the national living wage. It risks carers uh, losing the benefit if they go up one penny over it. 
forces them to negotiate with employers to potentially reduce their hours or stop working altogether. Does the First Minister agree that the carers' allowance earns threshold cliff edge as a disincentive to work and should be urgently reformed? First Minister. Well, I, I certainly agree that the DWP does not provide adequate support uh, to carers and I would like to see uh, that support increased and extended and I, I think Mark Griffin makes uh, a legitimate point. But that's exactly why uh, we are using uh, our powers here in Scotland to increase the support that carers uh, are entitled to. Uh, I said in my original answer, the carers allowance supplement gives an extra uh, just more than £450 a year to carers. Uh, that's uh, an increase in carers allowance of around 13 per cent. It would also of course introducing the young carers grant which will be an annual 300 pounds payment. Uh, so it's not just about financial support it's about support in other ways as well uh, but it's vital that we continue to do that and I hope collectively as a parliament we will also continue to uh, urge the UK government to give better support as well. Thank you very much and that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on shortly to a member's business debate in the name of Beatrice Wishart on the proposed centralisation of air traffic control in the Highlands and Islands. But we'll just have a short suspension before then to allow members, ministers and the gallery to change seats. A short suspension. <laughs>